I've had an absolutely insane last few weeks, probably the busiest time of my fishing career. So the guys here thought it'd be a great idea to catch up with you, find out a little bit about it, find out a little bit about how it all works. And I'm talking about international fishing. I'm talking about going out into Europe, taking the skills that we use on venues like this where I am today at Southfield and trying to apply them um, in what's an unbelievably competitive environment in so many ways. And when I was growing up, international fishing was the focus. International fishing was one of those things where I used to look at people such as Alan, Scott Horn, Bob Nudd, Will Raisin. They were my heroes. They were the guys that I aspired to be. They were the guys that I thought, wow, I love what they're doing. It looks great. It looks warm. It looks different. It looks exciting. And they were the things that I've always wanted to do in my fishing. So it's what I've been doing for a long time now. I mean, I first went on my first international trip in 2000. So you're talking over 20 years ago, which is quite a, a scary thought, to be honest. And I've been lucky enough to go in different places and win medals, gold medals as well. So it's been a fantastic trip. But so I want to talk about that aspect of it and what made this period of time so unbelievably intense. So first up, it was uh, going away with the Drennan England feeder team, a brilliant team that I've been part of now since 2018. Um, the guys there are fantastic. The, the people involved are absolutely fantastic anglers. When I first joined, Tommy Pickering was manager. Um, his support was unbelievable. And now we've got Dean Barlow in charge who's doing a great job. And he plays a big part in what we do because it's really important to remember that the manager is leading the group. The person who's leading the group is always gonna have different styles. Even if you're carrying on from somebody else, you're always gonna put your own personal style on it. And that's what makes it really interesting when we go abroad because you're a group of like 10, 11 people. So when we go away, we have the six anglers who are gonna sit on the box during the week and they're gonna put loads of time in, trying to sort the venue out. We get allocated a zone every day. So there's a draw on the Monday morning, right? You get a, you get a go in zone A, you get a go in zone B. You know, you get a go in all the zones over the course of the week. And you've got to try as an angler to figure out the venue and put it all together. But to do that, you're talking about up and down the bank. What about prepping all your bait? What about what other teams are doing, what about, you know, all the help of, of just getting your gear to where you are. It's a really, really hard week and you're trying to prepare yourself all the time at the highest level. So we're really lucky in the England feeder team that we've got the management, Dean Barlow, Jamie Harrison there, assisting Dean as assistant manager. They're obviously the eyes. They're making sure that we're, we're on track. They're making sure we're not straying from maybe where we should be going. And then we've got Rich Wilson, we've got Eddie Bryden, we've got Graham West. And those three guys were doing the most monumental effort sorting bait, um, all different types of bait preparation. I've never had it before. I'm turning up on these international events and I've got my bait ready for me to start my day. That's incredible. I don't have that in my fishing elsewhere. And when you're talking about three anglers who are themselves exceptionally good, they obviously know exactly what you want from your bait and they'll talk with us as well and work it out. So incredibly grateful for them and what they do. The week itself, this is the interesting thing for me about international fishing. And it's really important to remember this for you guys sitting at home. Hindsight, as I sit here and speak with hindsight, hindsight is a wonderful thing because obviously you know, you can see, you can look back and see it. When you're trapped in the week, you're trying to take things day by day. You're trying to analyze everything all the time. And it often leads you down like little rabbit holes. It often leads you down different ways. And we try really hard to kind of avoid that. We try to go, no, let's just get a feel for this place. Let's use the five days as a feel for this place. Like we kind of know what fish there are to catch. We know how to catch them. We know how they react to certain things. Don't get me wrong. Things like finding the best hook bait or finding the best way to feed or something like that, we can do dead easy. And we can do that all the time. 
However, you still need to use your angling brain whenever you sit down. So you're gonna take all that information and try and apply it. And the World Championships in Serbia was a classic example. So the venue itself was a 120 meter wide channel that comes off the Danube. Now the Danube by the time it gets to Serbia is like, well at places it's over two miles wide. It's absolutely phenomenally huge. So this 120 meter little channel would be bigger than most that we've got in England. In fact, I can't think of any 120 meter wide canals that we've got here. So you can imagine the size of this sort of place that we're fishing. And there's a lot of um, fish in the venue, but obviously a lot of these places in, in European countries, they can take fish. So when fish get to a certain size, you find often in these countries that the fish tend to stay a little bit smaller, don't tend to grow big because obviously they can be eaten and be taken and that sort of thing. And you end up with like lots of small fish like catfish, little carassio, bleak, little skimmers, and an odd little carp. And it makes it really interesting. They're what you're fishing for. Now, during the week for me, I'd had a really enjoyable week catching catfish i felt like i'd sort of got to grips with the catfish i felt i knew how i needed to change for them i knew how i needed to keep it going for them and keep bites coming for those sorts of fish but i also felt a bit nervous when it came to the short line now on the short line we'd established that we could catch some little carassio and little carp but as these weeks always go, for some people they end up catching a few fish on one method, for some people they catch fish on another. So I'd had some amazing information from other members of the team who had had a good day on the short line. So we'd had, you know, the likes of information from Adam Wakelin and Steve Ringer. You can imagine those guys giving me information about how they've caught some fish short. And of course I might say to them, well, this is how I've caught these catfish. So between us, we've got this picture. And we went into the first day thinking, maybe the chance of an odd bonus fish short early and then hopefully a few catfish through the middle and if you were struggling a bonus fish late or if you felt you had the, the space with the once you caught the catfish to push on with some bonus fish late so that was the rough plan we started the first day and we got there and because this venue is so huge and it's coming from such a huge system it would often be influxed with water overnight and we'd seen it during the week sometimes we'd get there and it'd be eight inches lower sometime we'd get there and it'd be higher every time it was higher it had a bit more color every time it was lower it had a bit less now on the friday when we practiced there was hardly any color in the venue it had dropped about 10 inches so it stands to reason that when we pulled up saturday morning and it was back to normal level the color had almost been flooded into the venue so we got there it was colored there was a lovely strong wind into the bank and the natural angler in me and all of the squad kicked in there might be some more fish short this is the sort of telltale thing you're looking for it's got color it's got cover think about the margins when you're fishing for carp so my commercial fishing experience is coming in here. I know if I've got a ripple in the margins and it's a nice colored venue, I can catch in shallow water. I know if the venue's clear and it's a calm day, likelihood is I'm gonna need more water over the head. So that experience from commercial fishing is also applied to the international stage. So having general fishing experience is essential to read the venue and read situations as you go in. So we've cast in on the first day, and you can imagine it for me, someone who hasn't really caught a great deal on a short line all week, round goes the tip, little Carasio within 10 seconds of the start, little skimmers, little Carasio, a brilliant first hour. Probably put well over a kilo in my net. I would say potentially a kilo and a half into my net. Now, when you think three kilo is the target weight, inside, I was buzzing. I was thinking, wow, I'm halfway to my target and I've got four hours to go. Now could be the time to catch some catfish. Catfish that I'd caught all week really well. So I've cast out onto my catfish line, no catfish. Now, this is the sort of thing that you might have in your nightmares. Oh my God, my tip's not moving. But because I'd caught short and because we'd practiced all week, I had a few different ideas. So you can't expect to catch a catfish straight away. I gave it 30 minutes and probably, I don't even know if I caught one. Maybe if I did, it was one or two. It was way too slow. But I'd rested the short line, came back in, caught a few more on the short line. So, okay, we're good, we're good. Now, on the Friday, we'd actually started up a new line 
in between the catfish line and the short line. So the short line was like nine to 12 meters. The catfish line was 35 to 40 meters. So I'd set another rod up, jumped off my box, sticked it up at around 20 meters, and I put two feeder falls in. Just felt I needed somewhere to go to rest the short line. Now that's fishing. You've got to use the fisherman in you to do that because obviously throughout the week, we hadn't really done anything like that. We'd only had a little play at it on the Friday, but sure enough, it worked. First chuck on it, nice carasio. Second chuck on it, nice skimmer. Couple of chunky catfish. It just gave me that breathing space that I needed to hopefully finish off on the short line. So the short line had gone by this point. You're listening to the guys talking. They're giving you information. Eddie Bryden was running my section like an absolute hero. It was fantastic. We've got one guy in the section with two massive bream. He's out of the equation. Forget him, he's gonna win, right? He's, he's there, that's no problem. So where can we get to? Can we get top five? I'm fishing short and sure enough, the wind's still going on. We're getting to the last hour. What do we know about from fishing in England? Fish turn back on closer in in the last part of the match. 45 minutes to go, I'm getting a few indications. Catch a few skimmers, caught a carasio. Right, we're going somewhere now. Bloodworm had been the best hook bait, but can I put a worm on? On went the big worm, 400 gram carp, then two carasio. Really, really exciting stuff. And I finished the match, got my last fish in. If I'd have chucked out again, I'd have caught another fish. There was that many fish there. My tip was moving, I was getting indications, and I was pumping as I put my rods down at the end. The result was just short of four kilos and second in the 18 peg section, which I was absolutely delighted about. Oh, a bit smaller, sorry. There were 15 peg sections, I think, 14 or 15. So second in that size section. Then the best possible news, get back and all the team have done well. We've got 14 points. Now, I cannot tell you that feeling on that Saturday night. You haven't won it. You're far from won it, but you've had a good day. And it's a really weird feeling. You all want to like high five each other, hug, embrace and be buzzing, but you can't. It's halfway, you can't be like that because you know that you've got another day to go. But of course, you go to bed thinking, we are in pole position in the best possible place to potentially win a medal. Now, what I think a lot of people at home don't realize is that when you've got 14 points is what we had, you're first, they see that England are first, but one point behind are Holland with 15 points. With 19 points, just five points away are Hungary. That's nothing, right? There was other teams on 20, 21. It's nothing, across five men, it's nothing, it's so tight. So you're only halfway there. We weren't 10, 15 points clear. There was loads of teams within six, seven points. So we knew that we needed another day. Now, the next day we got to the venue and it was flat calm. The wind wasn't blowing. It was forecast to blow later in the day. The color, it was a two or three inches lower. That color had just started to ease out of the venue. You could see your tip about this far down. Day before you could barely see it down here. Again, a difference. Now, we'd caught so well at like nine, 10 meters the day before. And this is hindsight. We, we agreed, provided there was still some color, we would start there because we all had such a good start. When we chucked in at the start, it didn't happen. Now for me, in hindsight, and we never practiced this all week, and I was looking at the anglers around, and an angler from Kazakhstan next to me, lovely guy, right? Kazakhstan, they don't compete on the international stage very often. He started at about 15, maybe even 18 meters, and he caught six or seven Carasio. Classic, if you think about it. The fish had just backed off a little bit. Maybe if we'd have started 15 meters, we would have had a better start. How can you change from a winning approach? You must understand that whole dynamic is, is colossal. It would have taken massive, massive, massive gamble to adjust your position. Now he's petered out of bites quite quickly and I've gone on the catfish line and unlike the day before, loads of catfish there head down catfish fishing. You're looking at anything between 18 and 20 an hour if you're really on it. And that may seem like, well, it's not exactly bagging, but with catfish, you have to wait for the fish to be definitely on before you pick up and wind in. And really you're looking at two to three minute turnaround. So 
you know, if you can get anything around 20, you're great. So I had 19, 19, 19, three hours running. Um, all looking pretty good, really. A variety of sizes. They averaged out about an ounce. Not massive fish, little spikes on them, which sounds quite daunting. But once you've caught three or four, you realise how to get hold of them without getting spiked and then put them in your net. Interestingly, little bits of worm was a great hook bait for those fish. Single dead maggot was a great hook bait as well. Blood worm tended to catch you the smaller one, so it wasn't something that we focused on. And then towards the end of the day, there is a decision to be made. The wind's back on now. Will there be some fish short? I think everybody felt there would be a few fish short, but when you've got information coming across the bank whereby we're doing well, we know Hungary have had three single big fish in three sections, one fish. They've got other fish with them, but they've got a fish around a kilo, right? Now that's huge, that is huge. They are pushing for an amazing score, but the Dutch, like us, are doing okay. And when you were trying to work it out, you imagine if you're on the bank, you're thinking, well, if we've got 20 points, we win gold. But if we've got 23 points, we're gonna be third. That's incredibly difficult to judge because I'm in a battle with two or three people. You've got people that probably something's been missed. So come the way in in my section, I fished for catfish till the end because it was all so close and I've finished. I need to make sure I've got this right. I believe I was fifth in my section. So we thought I was going to be third or fourth. The Spanish angler had had a massive bream. He would caught it early on. Nobody knew he had it. So all day, that's an angler you can't comprehend. And of course, that doesn't affect every team. The Hungarians weren't in my half of the section, so it didn't affect them. So you can imagine, that's a point swing. We've had that in Will Freeman's section, a point swing here or there. So the drama of how those points pan out. And we've ended up, we've ended up at the end of it all in third position. Now, there was, I believe, 28 teams competing in the World Feeder Championships this weekend, or the weekend where I was away. All 28 of those teams would do anything to get a medal. Last year we got a silver, this year we got a bronze. When you've been leading, it hurts. Everybody in the squad is a winner. They all want to have a gold medal at the end of it. But history tells me I've got two gold medals in my life from international events, European Championships, World Club Championships. They are not easy to come by. Gold medals are not easy to come by. Only two countries in the feeder across the 12 years have won it twice, England and now Hungary. That's how hard a gold medal is to come by. They are very, very difficult. So, looking back on it, being philosophical, it was an incredible, and I mean incredible, bronze medal something that I'm really proud of, something I know the whole squad are proud of. And throughout the event, Drennan did some amazing coverage. They've got a fantastic full length video on their YouTube channel. You can go and view that. Great video. Um, their support for the team is incredible. Um, it's a real honor to be part of that group of people. An absolutely fantastic setup. And something that I really hope if I can prove myself over the course of this year that I'll be involved with next year, which I'd love to be in Spain. But just a little insight there. Back home, I've got two days, just two days. I came home around about 10 p.m. on Tuesday evening. Friday morning at 5 a.m. I left my house to arrive with Alan Scott on to travel with Drennan Barnsley Blacks. Again, fantastic um, group of people and different because at Drennan Barnsley back, I'm really fortunate to be the captain of that team, which means, you know, I'm doing a lot of the management element of it, certainly leading up to the event. Of course, if you're going to fish, how can you do that at the same time? So I asked a great friend of mine, Mick Viles, to come in and be the on-bank manager, um, to be there keeping us all, effectively doing the role that Dean Barlow's done, in consultation with myself in terms of tactics and making decisions and looking at what people are doing so um it was that was the setup that we had we had a brilliant support oliver scotton gav liversidge we had tom noton and will freeman come out all these guys worked tirelessly to prepare the bait and help everything out 
a real team effort. Those guys are fantastic anglers. Again, they've been part of our incredible run of success with Drennan Barnsley Blacks, and they came out to support the guys that were on the bank. Now, the team for this event was myself, Alan Scotthorn, Jordan Holloway, Matt Godfrey, Frankie Janoncelli, and James Dent. A really strong group of anglers, um, and the venue in Poland, so off we set for Poland, two days driving, was a huge reservoir. Um, I'm here today at Southfield, which is, uh, like there's two lakes together at Southfield, so if you know Southfield, Poland was probably 50% again bigger than what Southfield is here. That sort of size of lake, I'm saying. Big lake, loads and loads and loads of skimmers. Absolutely solid with skimmers, but the pegs are about eight to 10 meters apart. In practice, they're eight meters. And I'm using Southfield as an example. I've measured the pegs today here. They're around about 12 meters. So imagine tighter pegging than you have at a place like Southfield. There's a lot of pressure on that venue. Now, this is a really interesting week for me because Barnsley have had an unbelievable amount of success that we should be really proud of. In World Club Championships, we've had numerous silver, bronze, and we have been World Club Champions, all in the last 10 years, which has meant that England are ranked number one in the world at club level when you go on the FIPS website. Now, Dial Dawkins have played their part in that by winning their title. Um, there was um, obviously a team uh, Saints from the uh, in the uh, northwest they went and, and had a brilliant trip as well they had a great result so their two results combined with Barnsley's success has put us number one something that I think England should be really proud of you know we're ranked number one in the feeder world championships we're ranked number one in the club world championships I'm really honored to play the part in that for the last 10 years um, and I think that anything where you're there is this sort of ranking across I mean, they're usually done five, six years, but they've extended it slightly with COVID, so seven years. It's a real honour to be, to be up there and, and, and ranked at number one. So going there, there's obviously a bit of pressure on you. You know, we've got some great people. I actually travelled with Alan Scotthorn, who recently retired from uh, international fishing with England, but you are talking about five times world champion, more medals than I can even dream of. So... There's a lot of experience there and we had a great journey looking, talking about possible methods. The week was fantastic. So you imagine I've been feeder fishing one week and then the next week I'm chucking my slider out. Been doing a lot of practice for that in the two or three months up and running. So every time I got a spare opportunity to practice the technique, I was out there practicing the slider. Brilliant, brilliant way of fishing, really good. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, incredible fishing. Probably caught 10 kilos, over 20 pound of skimmers every day on a slider, brilliant. As a team, we were getting better and better. We'd seen some of our anglers catch nothing where we'd practiced and tried things. And by Wednesday, everybody had had a brilliant day. Everybody knew they'd how to catch them. We knew how to catch these fish. But of course, with international fishing, things change. And of course, as we went into Thursday and then Friday, we ended up catching on a pole. Now, for Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, we'd all fed a pole every day, and none of us had caught anything, nothing at all. It was all slider. But now, now we had pole to contend with. So we had Friday practicing the pole, and we had a brilliant day. You know, an absolutely sensational day. We had a 12 kilo weight, a 10 kilo weight. In fact, our lowest weight was probably about nine and a half kilos. Brilliant, brilliant fishing. We felt we had something. We felt we'd fine-tuned the method to the best that we could based on the information we had, based on what we'd done. To illustrate the point, two boxes to our left with a fantastic Tubertini team from, uh, from Italy, and they'd had a really poor day. They'd just caught a caught three, four, five kilos. Slovakians ran next to them had caught big weights like us, and they were feeling a little bit, mm, don't know what to do. They'd seen how the Slovakians had fed, I think they felt they needed to do something different. And I'm using them because they ended up being champions of this event. And we'll get to that in a minute. So on the match itself, it was really interesting. On the first day, I drew a bit where they'd removed a load of stone from the venue. So for 10 pegs out of 150 or whatever it was, it would have been more. Nearly 200 pegs were mainly six to eight foot deep. For these 10 pegs, it was about 14 foot deep. So you can imagine 
when I chucked my waggler out to plumb up, we knew roughly it was in the area, but we didn't know exactly. I'm moving my slider knot up. I'm moving all my slider knots up on my thing. It's like, can you imagine that world championship morning? There I am on the morning of the world champs. All my rods and everything are beautifully set at this six to eight foot, and I've got to change everything to 14 foot. A great example of how you've got to adapt. Of course, the fish don't always, the same fish might not live in that sort of depth. So instead, what we're doing is we're feeding. I need to think about, mm, I'm going to fish for bigger fish. I need slightly bigger hooks. I might need to fish a bigger hook bait. I might have to catch on a pole. The match started, I've had three skimmers in three chucks on a pole. So literally 10 minutes into the match, I've got probably a good kilo and a half. What an amazing start to a world championships. Unfortunately, this is almost where it ended. There was no bites on the pole for anybody else in my area. The only fish that there were was some big bream. Now, the angler on my left had slightly deeper water than me, just almost like at the at where it sort of leveled off. He's caught five massive bream. That meant I needed to target a bream. So change a hook bait, bigger bait, out there with a slider. All my bites all week had been like little go-unders. All of a sudden, slider almost lifted clean out of the water and a big bream. So I've had a bream around about four pound. That's been a massive bonus, no other fish. And as you can see from the weights and where I was, in my 18 peg section, I came ninth. There was a good end, the far end was brilliant on the pole. And then Slovakia had had this sensational day fishing out of the deep water to catch 26 kilos and win the match. I've got to be honest, when you are looking on a world stage, the level of angler is unbelievable. Everybody is the best on in their country. That's why they're there. And the Slovakian to catch 26 kilos, I think I weighed three and a half kilos and came halfway. So you can see there was just, he was miles ahead, 10, 15 kilos ahead of the rest. Unbelievable. That tells me that a team are doing something different. Down next to James Dent in C-section, 23 kilos. First and second in the match, those two guys from the same team. It was almost like we got back that night and we'd scored 28 points. Now we'd been next to Slovakia in three sections and next but one in, in mine. And it was like, wow, they've really dominated their areas and that's cost us a few points. That's probably cost us seven or eight points, to be honest. Um, so we felt a little bit unlucky. So we thought, well, if we went and did the same thing again tomorrow, if we were unlucky again, we might score 28 points. And if we were lucky, we might score 20 points. That wasn't going to get us a medal. Now, when you think about that as an average, 28 points, that's almost like just over fifth average in an 18 peg section. That's pretty consistent. That's pretty good if you ask me. But the winning teams were averaging three. Right, they'd scored 15 points and the Italian team, who had had a terrible Friday, had an amazing day and they were leading the way. The Slovakians were second. As we travelled back, went for an ice cream, went for a coffee. Right guys, spend the next two hours getting your gear ready, getting yourself sorted. Come to the table in the evening with a bit of a summary for me. Tell me where we're at. Tell me where you think we're going to push on for gold. And as we sat around the table Saturday night, we felt during the week, whenever we'd put more joker in, we'd suffered a small fish in our pegs. And with the bream being caught, we thought, well, we haven't really caught many bream. Let's be more aggressive. Let's put more bigger baits in. Dead maggots, casters, worms, corn, hemp. So we decided as a group that we were going to do that at the start. Now we were going to take a small amount of joker, but we thought we don't want really to get distracted. We want to go for this positive, really aggressive approach with these other baits. So we took a bold decision not to take any joker. Now, that was with the thought in mind of scoring seven, eight, 10 points, which is what we needed for gold and, or a chance of gold. As it happens, gold was impossible. Um, but to get on the podium, we felt we needed to score well under 20 points, like 15 points to have any chance. And that sort of approach makes that possible. If we'd have fished the same again, 20, 15, 12 points was impossible. So we had to do something dramatic. 
But whenever you do something dramatic, it's like anything. The chance of the low score is 10, 15%. The chance of the high score is 85 to 90%. You have to accept that as a group. You have to accept that we could have a horrific day. In fact, that's more likely. So are you gonna try and save face, come fifth or sixth and drive back? Or are you gonna try and push for that medal? I think the fact that we've had um, five medals in seven attempts tells you that we're a team that want medals. And the other two times we were fourth, by the way. So we've always been there or thereabouts. So that approach was bold. And everybody went to bed that night full of energy, full of enthusiasm, and full of excitement on what the day could hold. Now, the next day was, a, was what we feared. For me, one of the best anglers in the world, Matt Godfrey, he's surrounded by people who are feeding Joker, he can't get any bites. Frankie Giannicelli, in my opinion, an England international, I'm sure that's gonna happen for him very soon. Um, he'd had an amazing first day can't get any fish with the anglers around him. Myself, I've got a Slovakia on one side, check the other. They're feeding lots of bait. I'm feeding lots of bait. I can't get a bite. Two and a half hours in, I'm actually blanking. And then I've caught five little skimmers for a terrible result. Slovakia, who have done brilliant, he's only come sixth, so we weren't in a great area. But it turns out that these, these teams have fed Joker, and lots of it over 250 mil joker at the start. Now, when you're feeding that sort of quantity of joker, you need to feed it in a specialist way. And it's something that we didn't do during the week. It's something that we didn't clock onto during the week. So we could never use the evidence to prove that that was gonna be the case. So we ended up falling back down to 11th out of 28 teams. And as we all got together at the end, the hard work, the effort, everything that went into it, I was expecting everyone to be a little bit flat, but do you know what? They weren't, nobody was. Big hugs, high fives, everybody grabbed a beer. We packed up and we went and had a great evening at the banquet, knowing that we had given ourselves the best chance. I think if we'd have had a steady day and come fifth or sixth, everyone would have been very flat. But to give ourselves that chance, maybe on the next time, we'll give ourselves a chance with a different bait, but that's how we went about. Now. Those trips are amazing. You come home, you're flat at the end of it, but you couldn't do it without the support and friendship of your mates. Great bunch of people, everyone involved, every single person I've mentioned on both those trips are incredible. Drennan International, their support for Barnsley Blacks, for me is, is incredible, for all the team is incredible. Huge thank you to them, and along with the feeder team as well. Like I said, there's videos there for you to watch. My final thank you, obviously, Preston Innovations, with all these events, everything I'm doing, I'm using their equipment when I'm abroad on the international stage. It never lets me down. Their support is vital for me and everything I do. Don't often get an opportunity in a video to chance to say thank you to them. But if you want to see everything that I do on these international trips, you can only look back on a catalogue of years of videos on the Preston Innovations YouTube channel all these different techniques, I can guarantee you, I've covered, all right? And if I haven't, we'll be doing them in the future. So enjoy. Thanks for joining me for this catch-up. I hope you found it really interesting. I've loved talking about it. See you soon.